welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be discussing chapter 4 of the Rhetorical Act and chapter 5 of Reading Pop Culture. So let's jump on in. In chapter, what is it, 4 of the Rhetorical Act, we talk about, um, we're talking about evidence and resources of evidence. And so I want to bring up the five biggest uh, types of evidence and so we have visuals, analogies, statistics, experts, and stories and so that's all five that we got there and so as you can see there's many different types and they come from charts to emotionally pulling stories to maybe emotionally pulling visuals um, to experts talking to you about it and quoting experts and then analogies which are actually the best ones analogies are the best because they have psychological appeal and they have rational appeal um and they help the audience rationalize and understand um what is trying to be said easier than just throwing in some statistics or having a story in there that isn't always summarized up at the end. So we got our five and so we got visuals, those are pictures, different things. They're often um, holistic, they're not very um, singled in. But they have a weakness of kind of being a little simple, which isn't the best. Um, analogies, actually, their primary weakness is that they're kind of irrelevant because, yes, there's psychological appeal and rational appeal, but how much is it really telling you? Um, so, statistics makes it super easy to zone in, but they're incomprehensible unless someone does a really good job about explaining what's going on in this graph and what made things spike and different things like that. Um, and then experts, um, those, that type of evidence enhances credibility, but could also create a bias. Um, Stories invite empathy, but they don't represent everything in what you're trying to say and um, different things like that. It's more, it, they're like personal stories for the most part or, um, well, no, they're, they're really only appealing to the psychological an emotional side of things, they're not rationally helping the the argument or what is trying to get through. So that's the rhetorical act. They talk about um, the different types of evidence and the good things and the bad things and Um, now, reading pop culture, we're in chapter five. Um, let's see. So, the first one in chapter five is, um, let's see, what is it? Eh. Eh. Um, oh, so it, yeah, it's talking about television addiction. And so, it's titled, Television Addiction is No Mere Metaphor, and... This is by Robert Kube and Michali um, Skinser Michali. Um, sorry if I can't say the right name. Um, but so in this one about television addiction, they go over the time of, oh, originally people didn't really think that they would have time for TV and they didn't think it would take off. Um, however, people instead made time for TV, like people tend to make time for reading 
and doing whatever hobbies they prefer. Um, so yeah, but they were also saying that through, um, they used a lot of statistics as their evidence and they actually, they also, they quoted Pavlov, which was an interesting, um, evidence, but so they quoted Scientific American, they took from the Gallup polls and actually a study where they gave a certain number of people beepers and when the thing beeped you had to write down what you're doing, how you're feeling, stuff like that. Um, and they took all from this that people that watch TV don't usually intend to watch TV for as long as they do, but watching TV leads to more watching TV. Um, and it's hard to go without TV if you've recently watched TV. Um, but, so they found that TV is only a problem when it needs to be, um, reduced and people can't, f um, aren't, they can't reduce the amount of time that they're viewing because they're addicted. Um, and I definitely understand what they're going through and what they're talking about because it's really hard to... Like, okay, I'm just gonna watch one show, but then there's a cliffhanger, and then you wanna watch the next episode, and then you start binge watching, and then it's 3 a.m. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but definitely, viewing leads to more viewing, and it's very. There. I don't wanna say it's 100% proven, I wanna say that there's definitely a correlation. Um, but they took from a study that Byron Reeves um, from Stanford and Esther Thorson from the University of Miss, uh, Missouri, they did a, they tried to figure out what it was about television that kept you attentive and made the viewing lead to more viewing. And so... They realize it's not the form, but it's the content that makes t uh, television very unique. And you can go in from different angles and it captures emotion and different things like that. But I also thought it was interesting how um, the authors talked about um, how at one point when television came out and some video games, um, 700 Japanese kids were rushed to the hospital due to different things like seizures, um, and that was because there's flashing lights, there's things trying to get your attention, and it's trying to keep you focused, but it was just too much, that sensory overload. Um, but so definitely this article, um, of television addiction is no mere metaphor, it's actually serious because people are getting addicted to this television and not just that, our smartphones and different things like that. Um, but television dependence should be taken seriously and I agree with a lot of what this article is saying because it's something that's very relatable because it's hard to only watch an hour or two um, or like a few times a week and not just whenever you have free time because it's kind of a waste of free time and but people can't help themselves. Um, so we're going to go on to article two, Girls, Girls, Girls by what's her name? Roxanne Gay. And so it's very interesting because in this article she put herself as the main character and she would say like, oh, the main character, me, dot, 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 even though the main character was a runaway named Hannah and um, she was much younger than 
the author. I don't know. It was kind of weird. Um, but so it examines all the characters and talks about how you saw a lot of Hannah and you saw the ins and outs of her life. Um, this is kind of a quote from the book where she says, we actually get to see Hannah Hovath eat, fuck, and endure the little humiliations in girls' lives. And I think that's actually very interesting because I thought about it and in girls' lives, I don't know about boys, I can't speak on that, but in girls' lives there are a lot of little humiliations that we go through and it's kind of hard for those to get represented in the media. Um, but so therefore, because they show so many of those things, it makes the character real and relatable, and that's why Roxanne sees that she is this character. Um, she then started to kind of talk about Bridesmaids and how that um, woman-driven comedy was coming out and it had to be successful because if it wasn't and it wasn't portrayed the right way, it would set women back and not allow them to really be able to thrive in the, the comedic, um, realm. Um, she was a little bit, um, critical of the, of all the characters. She seemed, she compared a boyfriend that one of the characters had to all the... I don't know, all the, the a-holes that a girl would date in her life, and they put it all into one character, which she didn't really like, and I can see why she wouldn't like that, because it's just a bunch of stereotypes and a bunch of different things mashed into one person, and it makes them a little bit less realistic. Um, but she tried to show that Girls, Girls, Girls represents privilege, nepotism and race um but I I definitely got what she was trying to say um because the show was primarily all white minus a black boyfriend that um Hannah had at one point but that didn't last and the the privilege and the nepotism is that the actual creator of Girls, 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 um, was someone whose parents, um, I believe her mom worked in the industry and it was just friends, nepotism, the, fr her friends that they casted and it was all just wrapped up in a little present for her to create her own story. Um, but so that was Girls, Girls, Girls. We're going to move on to, um, the next one. The next one is, um, the apocalyptic strain in popular culture. The American Nightmare Becomes the American Dream by Cantor. And so in this, he likes to talk about how pop culture is full of doomsday scenarios and like there's Walking Dead and he talks about falling skies and... He also says we, we might as well live in the Middle Ages when there was the plague and people battled in real life and fought and everything. Um, not that we don't battle in real life, but that's more on a battlefield. <laughs> um, and he says, like, where are the happy household shows? Like, we no longer have the nuclear family shows very much that are happy and everything. But like my creative writing teacher says we get really skeptical of people that are actually happy. We think there's something underlying and they're, they're just going to blow up eventually. Um, cause you can't be happy all the time. But so for decades, we wanted the American dream that involved a house, three cars, the newest appliances, a job, financial security, which especially this came because of the great depression. But so now it comes in a neatly wrapped institutionalized box, which our author puts a very negative view on it by saying it's similar to selling your soul to corporations for comfort and security, which I believe is 
just a little bit extreme. Um, and so people now are rethinking the American dream and they're turning away from doctors and schools and have little faith in our president and Congress. Um, and our government actually plays a big role in this in that the government has grown so big that in end of the world scenarios, these governments will not, they're too big that they'll have to break into smaller parts to actually protect um, their people and their citizens. But so if it was smaller, it would be closer to the people, better to protect them. Um, but I guess you could say it would be smaller armies. But if it was, we'll get into that later. Um, and we also need to realize that all of our technology is not making us happier. And so people are straying away from doctors, schools, technology, and we want these doomsday things instead. And it shows in our media. And one example is Falling Skies, which includes an alien attack where all internet and communication is knocked, yeah, knocked out. Um... And in the end, p parents are homeschooling their kids and bonding um, because they don't have that institution and their jobs is to teach their kids and so they're focusing on them. And there's only one doctor and they work together and they come together like a community and fight against whatever they need to to stay alive and they support each other. And similarly, we look at The Walking Dead, and it's a plague that hits, for some reason, everywhere at the same time, roughly. And so, we see these herds of zombies. Um, these are the impersonal institutions, and how they don't really care about you, they just care about taking, I guess, your money, and... They don't, they're impersonal. So, governments try to turn us into zombies is something that Cantor believes. He thinks that um, if the government turns us into zombies, it's easier to control us. But, so, in The Walking Dead, the, the humans first look at the government, which I think uh, if it were to really happen, that would be what a lot of people do. Um, and then it, he talks about the whole plot of Walking Dead where they go to the CDC but he's a mad scientist and then they go to a farm and a prison and they all take refuge and it works for a while but not really. Um, but even with all these weird scenarios going on, the people still have each other and, like, they have freedom. And so they have freedom, but they're not as safe as they'd hoped. But they're no longer dependent on these institutions. Um, and so it's interesting how our ideal world has changed from our Western living hype of three cars, white picket fence, all that, to now we want to go be independent and shoot zombies. <laughs> um, no, but so the real dream that people are more likely wanting is to be like the, the rugged individual with independence and freedom and is able to be self-reliant, but I think that people could do that and still live in this world without the need for zombies. I just believe that we aren't strong enough to do that on our own. We are too dependent on institutions that we need to lose them all to to save ourselves, I guess. Um, anyways, and now we're going to go on to the next one. So Netflix and the Future of Television um, by Ken... Aletta. I hope that was right. I don't know. Um, but so, yeah, this was really interesting. I liked it. Um, they laid everything out chronologically. So they go, 
in 2000, Netflix was losing money. They offered Blockbuster, um, what's it called? Um, they offered Blockbuster a deal and Netflix.com, if the deal was taken, it would have been Blockbuster.com. Wow. I did not know that. And that, wow. And Blockbuster is out of business now, so, um, but so 2000, they were losing money. They offered a deal. Blockbuster declined. In 2004, Blockbuster started their own online subscription, but it failed because Netflix had been doing really well. And in 2005, Netflix had 4.2 million subscribers. So not only is this a very, like, this article is very straight to the point, kind of like with the chronological order. But it also has a lot of statistics that are easy to read, which I think really benefits them and what they're trying to say. Um, they also stated that at peak times, Netflix had twice the net traffic as YouTube, which I think is very important to state because YouTube, owned by Google, is one of the biggest streaming um things out there. They even have their own, like, YouTube TV that they're probably trying to get you to subscribe to. Um, but YouTube is huge. And then, so, around 2007, it was on Prime, um, CBS, Hulu, those all started because of this big Netflix thing. Um, and they're all doing pretty good. And with every TV being, every device being a TV now, it's super easy for these apps, these websites to get, um, net traffic. And so, when Netflix made profit and went public in 2002, it really changed the game. Um... And so, it's very interesting that a lot of money goes into advertisements on television. But now, people are reconsidering because so many people are streaming now. With Now it's connected to your TV. There's smart TVs with apps. There's thing, like literally flash drive things that you plug into your TV which I believe is what Amazon had um, before all the Amazon Prime live streaming, or not, not live streaming, but Netflix like streaming. Um, and that hooks you up to access all the Amazon things. Um, but so much money goes into cable ads and people are thinking, is it worth it? Um, people are also thinking... You can stream super easily now, so why buy cable? And I think the last thing that, th this is something I kind of learned from it, um, is that broadcasted TV, like, you can get, you can get anything broadcasted, um, if you have the, the dish, old dish, <laughs> um, but if you want, like, fast forwarding, recording, all that stuff, you need a television provider, but Broadcasted TV, you could watch the Olympics, American Idol, the Super Bowl, and that's the only real thing for it, and you don't need fast forward, and you don't need pausing and everything, but I think we're also changing in that we like to watch rerun reruns like Netflix is, and we like to watch things without commercials, um, which is something that Netflix has. Hulu has commercials, which you have to pay extra money. Um, you have to pay extra to go without, but I don't know. So, YouTube is huge. Netflix is huge. All this streaming is changing the way we watch TV and Future of television at this point is a little bit unknown because will people stop watching cable and just stream or will they, I don't know, 
Will nothing change at all? Some Or something new? Who knows? Um, okay, so that's everything. We got all the different things. Awesome. Um, I'll see you next time.